Thank you to Enterprise for hosting as always. Uh, thank you to Ideas by Nature, our awesome sponsor, who you're going to hear from very shortly. Uh, this is Corey, this is Sasha, also organizers of this meetup. Um, quick show of hands, who was at Discom in Boulder this past weekend? Okay. If you weren't at Discom or didn't hear about it, keep an eye out next year. It's going to be really cool. Uh, I think it's emblematic of how awesome this community is. Really cool, very organic, substance over hype type of conference in Boulder. Um, there's going to be a lot of collateral coming out or in content around that uh, that will be online. You can check out shortly. Um, also, just our usual reminder is uh, this is about the tech, not the price. And I think it's very cool we're in the middle of a crypto bear market, yet look at all of us. Um, price going up is cool, making money is cool, but building tech is really freaking cool too. And that's what we talk about here. Uh, so, thanks again for coming. Um, we have, I think, at least one community announcement. Uh, Dan, would you like to talk about the hackathon? Sure. So, talking about building these tools, hackathons are like my ideal line to make that happen. And as Shasha is so uh, kind to, to point out, there's flyers all over the place for this Wyoming hackathon that's going on September 7th to the 9th. So right now on DevPost, there's somewhere around 50 people, and they're capping out about 400. And I'd love to see a Colorado contingent of Question. developers up there. Yes. How much prize money is there available? Oh, I think there's around $50,000 available in prize money. Oh! Yeah. And, uh, Question. So, yes. When is the hackathon? Oh, it, it's from the 7th to the 9th uh, so of September. Yeah. And it's 2018. Yeah. This year. This oh, year. Thank you. I'm supposed to say his event, which is next year. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to see any devs, that's what they're really focused on, but design work and people who want to help manage projects, this will be a really great place to do it. Talking about um, interesting people who are going to be there, uh, Joe Lubin is apparently going to be speaking and walking the floor as a mentor, which is pretty cool. Um, and Eric Voorhees, I know, is going to be doing something similar. We also, I think, the uh, founder of um, Overstock.com and a few other interesting faces are going to be there. So it'll be a great place to go and do some fun stuff and meet some great people. Speaking and talking. Yeah. And walking. And walking. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, yeah, let me actually know some points. Hey, everyone. So uh, we've been, uh, how many of you have heard of the Blockchain Council, the Governor's Blockchain Council? Yes. Raise your hands, most of you, some of you. Yep. Uh, so the council is broken up into 12 working groups, and uh, each working group is tackling different totally different working models. Well, not totally different. Some of them have a lot of overlap, but they're different nonetheless. Um, the documents that the working groups are, are working on, they are all open, and they are, um, we have a, a whole lot of volunteers that are adding thoughts and helping us think through these problems. So if you'd like to be a volunteer and contribute your thoughts to these working documents, um, just let me know and I'll send you a link to, to where you can sign up to volunteer and you'll get comment access to the Google Docs. Um, and we're going to put on, I'm going to put on a, a series of smaller events that will be more like town halls so we can talk through um, what's going on in the council and what policy recommendations I think we're going to put together for, for the next legislature. And, uh, and then we're putting on a much larger event in October at the Sports Castle. Um, and there will be, I think, maybe half of the Blockchain Council will be in attendance at that event. So if you want to talk to people on the council, you have the opportunity to do so. Yes? Why do I want to contribute to this? Why do I care? Uh, well, this is like your one time. I feel like there's not a lot of opportunities to turn these big philosophical ideas into actionable government policy. Um, you've got you've got the microphone. I actually have the microphone, but you've got um, something more powerful, which is the keyboard. And uh, you can really help formulate, because a lot of these things are big open questions. So we, we really could use your help 
in coming up with what 21st century um, governance looks like within the blockchain community. Any other questions, Dan? Um, <laughs> mostly just how do I get involved? I think you said you'll send a link. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what we'll do? Should we send out a link to the whole, uh, all the attendees? Sure, if you guys want, through meetup.com. Did everybody get through meetup.com? Yeah, everyone's a meetup. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. We'll send out a link if you want to volunteer, you'll know where to sign up. Thank you, Sasha. Um, so, the, the common thread for tonight, it, uh, it kind of flows through everything Sasha just said, and on the state government level, and through the projects we're going to hear about tonight, is... Uh, Colorado is a really awesome place for this burgeoning technology. If you're new to this space, you're joining at a really good time, things are really picking up. If you've been in it for a while, you know really well how, how interesting this is and how much of an episode this is. Maybe you yourself are building something innovative. So uh, we have three really cool presentations tonight. Uh, we have Drew Miller talking about supply chain management on the blockchain. Uh, we have Alan from Radar Relay. Uh, they are a homegrown company uh, from Fort Collins. They started out in Fort Collins and they are a decentralized exchange, which is super fascinating technology. We're going to hear about that. And next up, we have Kate and Ben from our sponsors, Idea by Nature. Um, they are going to be talking about something that is overlooked way too often in the decentralized application world, and that's user experience. We can have all this decentralization, but if we're using like a command line interface, it's kind of a shitty experience for the users. So they're going to talk about best practices and all sorts of really cool stuff uh, to improve the user experience. So with that, I'll hand it over. Sounds good. about the products that we're building on the blockchain because right now crypto is like kind of the face of the blockchain for the public but we all know in this room that it can do so much more and I think what we're going to talk today is about how UX can help kind of make a mass adoption happen. So, hi, I'm Kate Garrigan. Um, I am a UX designer at Ideas by Nature so what I do is I design products based on the end needs of users and involves a lot of talking to people, moving pixels around, testing, all of that good stuff. And I'm Ben Bradburn. I'm a project manager at Ideas by Nature, but I am a student of service delivery and user experience. So when I heard Kate was doing this, I had to get involved. And just a quick note that the citations and references that we're going to use throughout this will be in the notes of the presentation and we'll publish them later. So if there's anything you find interesting, you'll be able to find that at a later date um, online. So, make the blockchain easy. What can I kind of go over today is kind of a couple comments people have made recently about the blockchain, what the hurdles are to adoption to people that aren't as familiar with the tech, how UX has helped complex technologies succeed in the past, how UX can help the blockchain succeed with some specific tips, um, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions. Okay. So some of you may know Vitalik, father of Harry, said this recently on Twitter. I think there's too much emphasis on Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever electronic transfer funds, and not enough emphasis on making it easier for people to buy five to hundred dollars in cryptocurrency via cards at corner stores. The former is better for pumping price, but the latter is much better for actual adoption. And then leave another quote. So this guy, um, another name you might recognize, um, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, he spoke on Monday in Denver. Yep. Was anybody there? Anybody? You nice. may have heard us hooting. Yeah, you may have heard me yell when he said this. This is actually a direct quote from his presentation. Um, wallets, exchanges, ATMs, these are boring infrastructure projects. They're not cool, and they require a lot of focus on user experience and design. The first people who got Bitcoin to where it is today are entirely unequipped to get Bitcoin to where it needs to get the next stage. Which is why we need to be nicer to the people with the purple hair 
who know how to design a fucking user experience <laughs> and recognize that it's not just about the protocol. So you guys can't have Kate. We're really fond of her, but find a Kate. If you can't find a Kate, take some of the lessons from this presentation and start learning about user experience. It's very intuitive, but it's often overlooked because we're so close to our products. I don't have purple hair anymore. Anymore. Yeah. It's a solid watch. So, some little stats on the general public's interactions with the blockchain. 80% of people don't understand blockchain technology. 59% of people haven't even heard of it. And less than 8% of Americans own cryptocurrency at all, at all. And that 8% is important is because people, as I mentioned before, intrinsically tie blockchain to cryptocurrency. So um, also this is from an HSBC study. So why, why are these stats important? So if you want your product to succeed and the blockchain to gain mass adoption, I would say it's a fair assumption that everybody in this room wants the blockchain technology to grow. So if you want that, you need to ask yourself, who are you building your product for? And it shouldn't be yourself, because otherwise you're going to have a customer base of one, and you're not going to be very profitable, and you're not going to have very much of an impact. Um, so then, why are you building this product? What need are you solving? What problem are you solving? Because one of use this is a quote, one of usability's most hard-earned lessons is that you are not the user. Designed to optimize the user experience for outsiders, not insiders. Uh, Jakob Nielsen said that, really good guy to read up on if you're interested in user experience further. Um, the number of people who work on the blockchain full time is, is relatively small but grown. There's a citation in there I won't read from. But even if a million people worked in blockchain, that's about seven plus billion people that don't. So there's seven plus billion people without specialized knowledge, without technical know-how or training on how this stuff works. And those are the people that we need to reach in order to grow. So what, what are some of those specific hurdles that people outside of the blockchain are kind of facing as they try to delve into this world? And I have just a few examples up on screen. Um, there's a lack of clear sources for education in English and also in languages that are not English, in Spanish, in Mandarin, in Cantonese, in all kinds of languages. Um, there's a lack of customer service, aka help when things go wrong. Um, there's a reliance and a, a great use of jargon, and if people don't understand what you're talking about, they're not going to listen. There are unfamiliar conventions to the blockchain that aren't bad, but aren't always well explained, like the fact that a transaction is irreversible, that transactions take time, and that there are transaction fees. Most of this stuff, people don't know they're familiar with it, but it's hidden. And we have to, it, it behooves us to discuss it. So in, in addition to these things, Extreme market volatility is outside of our control, but as the people trying to promote this technology, we, we have to be prepared to explain it. And general flood and misinformation. There's a lot of nonsense out there about crypto and being a Ponzi scheme that we know is just not true. So all of these kind of things are preventing people from embracing the blockchain further. But UX has kind of overcome these hurdles before in the past with other complex technologies, and it certainly can for the blockchain. So let's take a quick look at some historical examples. So some of you may roll your eyes at this example. <laughs> AOL, right? But you all know what it means. You all know AOL. So before AOL, logging onto the internet, you had to know the speed of your modem. You had to know the speed of the modem pool you were going to connect to, the IP address. Maybe they had a DNS name, maybe. But more than likely, you need to do the IP address. You probably had to read this manual, which wasn't going to be easy. You had to know a little bit about computers to make sure the thing was working and you had the right drivers. It was a nightmare, right? And then AOL came along and they gave you a CD that was almost like malware in that you put it in your computer. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, let's be real, it was a little bit malware. But, uh, but you just put this thing in your computer and you were connected to the internet. And it still told you what was happening, if you cared, right? Connecting using TCP IP, but you didn't know that was transmission control protocol, IP or internet protocol. You didn't care, you were just online. And for many people, this was the internet for a long time. To the point where in May of 2015, 2.1 million people still were using AOL dial-up. 
in November 20th of 2015, they still had 174 million unique monthly viewers, more than Wikipedia. And yeah, that's the real stat. We got the, we got the site in there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Instant Messenger lasted until the 15th of December 2017. And when it went away, people were pissed. They weren't happy. They were really upset. Like, this was the internet. So, previous to AOL, it was a pain in the neck. And you had to know the protocol. You had to know the technology. After AOL, it didn't matter. You just connected to the internet. So a kind of off-screen example is the automatic transmission. Um, how many people here know how to drive uh, manual? Yes. Cool. How many people drive manual on a regular basis? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Very good. Small, hearty population. Glad to hear. But as you can see, there's a, uh, the, what the automatic transmission did was greatly reduce the number of steps and the knowledge needed to drive a car, right? And whether you're driving manual or automatic, you're going to get in, start your car, and get from point A to point B. The end result, while well, the experience may be different, is very similar. So what automatic transmissions did is they reduced the cognitive load on users so that it could focus on the job at hand. Less steps and less knowledge were needed to drive at a similar level and get to the same end goal. Importantly, it reduced physical ability. Now you only needed two functioning limbs to drive a car, whereas you need three to drive a manual. So drivers with disabilities we're now able to access this technology and drive safely. It also reduced risk. You had less of a chance of damaging the engine through mistakes or inaction if you weren't as well versed in how to drive a manual transmission. So what the automatic transmission did, much like AOL, is that the interface changed. The interface was easier to use, but the technology and the benefits of the technology remained the same. So for the blockchain, how can the UX do this for the blockchain? What, what is the automatic transmission for the blockchain? So one, one of the hurdles people find is that trying to get into the blockchain for the first time can be arduous. And I have a couple smaller examples at the bottom. Um, paying for something in crypto if you've never done it before can be massively confusing. At the same result, sending crypto to a friend, backing up or restoring your wallet, uh, buying crypto for the first time from USD or another um, physical currency. Trying to buy a coin that your friend is making that's not Bitcoin or Ethereum can be very hard and very challenging. But, and what we're not doing is we're not expressing the value of these to the users as well as we can. So what we need to do, tip, talk, put your product in front of users, not experts, and just listen to them talk about it. They can be your friends, they can be your family, just say, what do you think of this thing? Right, because the products we make, they're always first drafts, right? We can always iterate it on a little bit. So what this does is, you find out what your user wants, you find out how you can solve their problem, and you do crazy technical feats, crazy awesome things to do that. Not necessarily just a technical feat in a vacuum. The more people that use your product, the more people are going to recognize how cool and awesome we all are, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> cool, so when users are invested in their goals and they feel like their needs are being met, they're going to be like, okay, this might be a little hard to do, this might be scary, but I'm, I'm committed, you clearly understand me, you want me to succeed, so I'm going to do it. And that's one way to help me the blockchain succeed. So when things are scary, things can be very scary about the blockchain for people that don't know the technology. Um, the use of jargon, not understanding what's going on. Uh, securing your pins and phrases. Um, I cannot be the only one that's guilty of writing down my 12 word phrases on post-it notes. That's kind of terrifying, right? Transaction times. Um, when crypto keys were taking hours to transact, people had no idea what was going on. The fact that you can't uh, do a chargeback on an irreversible transaction. And being your own bank, when you're writing down your numbers on post-its, is terrifying to people. We, we can do better. If we want to empower people to be their own bank, we have to show them that it's worth it. We have to make it easy for them to do. We want people to rise up and say, yes, we want to use Bitcoin. We want decentralization because it's easy to use, it's safe, and it's secure. So how do we do that? Simple. We communicate what's happening in clear, plain language. Users should always be able to understand what's on the page in front of them without having to look a word up in a search engine. So we all know Google and Gmail. They're words in the dictionary. Google still has tool tips to explain parts of its features that we have all grown so accustomed to because they're still building for new users 15 years plus. How awesome would it be to have a wallet and be like, yeah, it's been around for like 20 years, but we're still bringing in new users. We're still helping people learn. Cool. Jargon and technical terms turn people away 
you, you can avoid them. There are, there are better words, you know, maybe rope in your English major friends, figure some stuff out. But if people understand what's going to go going on, they're going to be into it. If they don't understand, they're going to leave, and they're not going to come back. They're going to be like, nope, this is not for me. I, this is not my area. I'm giving up, just because they don't understand. So um, just three, three things that I think, from my perspective, that could really be explained better are things like transaction times. Let people know that you have to wait. Irreversible. Give them a chance to edit or to back out of a transaction before they make it, and gas fees. We all know that people, merchants don't like to use American Express, right, because they charge merchants a higher fee. People understand that. All we need to do is say, you know what, because we're taking this into our own hands, we're in charge of the fees now. So this is an example, and you don't have to dumb it down. You don't have to condescend or be like, this is what's going on. You just have to speak plainly. You don't have to hide the tech even or try to dress it up to be something it's not. But if this is a wallet, just let somebody know, okay, we're restoring your wallet. Um, before this step, probably, we're going to restore your wallet. Where you're restoring your wallet, your wallet has been restored. You're letting somebody know what's going to happen, what's happening, and how long that might take, or where your progress is, and when it's done, and where to go from there. Third? <laughs> so, when things are hard, um, transaction times, irreversible, <laughs> irreversible transactions, weird errors that don't make any sense, bad jump destination, <laughs> What does, that, what does that mean? All I know is my money disappeared. I'm not a fan of that. So what, what do we do with, with that when things are hard? Um, plan for misunderstandings, mistakes, and misinformation. Missing information. You will have problems. No product is perfect. No exchange is perfect. No app is perfect. There will be issues. And when they happen, it's going to make or break your user's experience. Customer experience and service a delivery is an often overlooked part of tech in general, and in particular in this space. So how will you help people back on the right path without having to leave their current journey? We think a lot about happy paths and, and going and making a purchase, or delivering the action, or tracking the thing. We don't think about what's going to happen when that doesn't work, and how do we get people back to where they need to be. So think about that. How do you deal with support and feedback? Plan for it. Plan to scale it if you plan to grow. You need to grow your support along with your infrastructure. And think about how you're going to harvest information from support. This is one of your most valuable resources in terms of product design and product development. People are going to tell you what is wrong. They're either going to tell you directly or they're going to tell you by mistakes that they made, by abandoning the user path that they're on. And you can learn from that and you can better um, serve them as a result. And when they have bad experiences, you will lose them. Customers tell an average of 15 people about a negative experience and an average of 11 people about a positive one. They're much more likely to communicate a negative experience about your product and about our technology and our industry in general than they are a positive one. And 51% of customers will never do business again with a company after one negative experience. You have one shot when it goes wrong to keep them in the fold. And that can be the difference between having a customer for life and an evangelist and having someone leave you. So here's an example, as much as it pains me, uh, Microsoft has done a really good job with this. They, they've covered a whole bunch of different problems. Did you misspell your username? Did you use the wrong username? Were you actually trying to sign up for an account? Or, you know, what, what's going on? It can access your account kind of covers all of these. I don't know what's going on, just I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna figure it out. If I need a new account, I can create one. Um, they're telling me what's happening and they're giving me a whole bunch of different options on what to do. And hopefully this can't access your account actually leads to a person who can help me. We're just going to assume that it does. You guys will do that whether or not they did. Um, but they've planned for every eventuality. They've explained to me what's going on. And I know that I'm going to be able to get through this. I'm not just out on an island. So in the end, make it easy. Help the blockchain succeed by making products built on the technology that's easy for people to use. Break down steps, listen to users when they tell you what's important to them. Communicate what's happening in plain language and plan for mistakes, no one's perfect. Show people how your product will add value to their lives by making it easy to use and useful. Don't just tell them. So as much as we all kind of laugh at the AOL, it's like ta ha ha, the AOL either directly or indirectly brought the internet, internet into almost all of our homes. And with the internet so widespread, the blockchain was possible. 
So what is going to be the AOL of the internet? What is going to make the blockchain so massively popular people are going to cry when an old program goes dark? The end. <laughs> sense that you want to go and beta test this stuff with real live people with your product immediately, as soon as you can, as much as you can. But then counter that, you're also saying, well, 50% of people, if they have a bad user experience, cut, like, immediately, they'll never come back. So I'm wondering, though, in the frame of me actually going and offering to get feedback versus them going out in the wild and getting a negative experience, like, I think there's totally different frames. So my question is, how do we frame out in the wild to look like I'm trying to get your user feedback so that you keep your customer? Sure, so there are easy ways to do it. People can generally be understanding. When you say something is in beta, you let them know. It's like, all right, guys, this is in beta. If you have problems, you have a little tool tip, send me an email. Maybe they're going to be gracious enough to give you their email and let you contact them. Ask them, you know, how's it going? <laughs> Tell me about a recent experience you've had. Show that you are gaining their, you are trying to get their feedback, that you're listening to them, and that you're working to make your product better. People will be patient and they will understand that, okay, yeah, you know what, this, this kind of broke, this kind of sucked. But I sent you a message, you said, yeah, I got it, we're working on it. Awesome, I was listening to you, that's great. And even when we're talking about testing, maybe even before it goes to beta, as few as five people can give you incredibly useful information, that's all. It can be five people, five of your friends, five people you pull off the street, and you'll, you'll get almost everything that you need to from those people, from their comments about what's easy and about what's not. Um, if you go to um, Jakob Nielsen's uh, site, he is the uh, he, key to UX is what Vitalik is to Ethereum, essentially, that, that's his, his cred. He, he explains very nicely and concisely on his site how you only need five people, and sometimes maybe as soon as three. So I'm sorry, that, that was kind of two things. You can test with few people if you want to test before you launch, but when you launch, let people know you want their feedback and let them know you're listening. They'll be patient, they'll listen to you. And a negative user experience is, is the whole thing. What we're talking about with the 51% is people that have a negative experience, most likely because of customer experience. What, what, you'll, what you see is that, if, especially if you're in beta and you communicate to people well and you have a line for them, that's, that's where you're going to lose them, is if they send you an email and you don't respond for two weeks. That's where they're gone. If they send you an email and you respond in 20 minutes and say, what's going on, I really want to know, that's a, that's a totally different user experience. Yeah. Anybody else? Cool. Thanks, everybody. You all agree. Awesome. <laughs>
that said, uh, I want to introduce Alan with Radar Relay. Radar Relay is a Colorado-based company. Uh, they just got a Series A. They're kicking maximum ass. Uh, he's going to drop some serious knowledge. Hey guys, it's way too loud for me. How, how's that in the back? Cool. I'm um, excited to be here. So, fun fact, one year ago today, almost a year, I was at an Ethereum Denver meetup in stealth mode. Um, and it was before we had launched, and it's, it's just uh, so thrilling for, for me personally and for our company to be here a year later and see the community still going strong. So thanks for the organizers, and, and thanks for the invitation. I am going to pace a little bit, so I know it's going to be tough for you. Stop this, this, this pillar to this TV is my, is my room, okay. Um, so before I jump in, we were talking a lot about users and UX in the last presentation. So I want to understand who, who are my users here. So I just want to do a quick, quick show of hands, um, not on who's a radar user, um, but engineers. Let's just show of hands for engineers. Okay, it's about, it's about half the room. Um, show of hands of who's using Exchange. Okay, the whole room. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so um, when uh, let's let's just do a quick question on radar. And, and it, we're going to have a secret surprise from my fellow radar, Connor. Connor, stand up, say hi. We have a t-shirt gun, and I'm curious, radar users, show of hands, any? One? <laughs> okay, cool. So, so Connor, Connor's got a few shirts, um, some swag to hand out. If you raise your hand for radar user, come, come see Connor. Let's, let's get those handed out. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's, let's find this presentation. So Ben, where did you... You are the man. I came very prepared. Cool. So three general rules. Um, three general rules of presentations for me. The first is if I use an acronym, somebody throw something at me. Seriously. Um, second is if, if I say something that is too confusing, it's too complex, doesn't make sense, just yell out what. Seriously. I know it can be disruptive for some presenters, but I found that when it Cool. Sweet. Sweet. Um, yeah, so seriously, if I say something that's too confusing, too complex, uh, throw, just throw out what? Um, I'm going to talk really fast. The goal is to get through all this stuff in like 10 or 15 minutes, and then spend the rest of the time answering questions. Um, and then third, um, I'd really love if everybody could just laugh at just one dumb joke throughout the presentation. It'd make me very happy. Um, okay. What is done? Um, so we're going to cover three things broadly. First is exchanges. So most of the room raised your hand on exchanges, so that'll make my job really easy. Then we're going to talk briefly on radar. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I think some of you guys might have questions on the other areas. We can cover that in Q&A. And then I'm going to cover the Xerox protocol, what, what makes us work. So for, for many of you who have been in the space for quite some time, you've noticed um, the, the centralized exchange model. Maybe you started on Mt. Gox, maybe you're a Coinbase user, maybe it's Bitfinex, what have you. Kind of the same thing that, that you, we had years ago, right? When those came online in the early days. I'm gonna go, no microphone. Can you guys hear me in the back if I talk pretty loud? Cool. Um, so, so if you've been using centralized exchanges for a long time, you've seen the architecture pick say the same, right? You deposit into a centralized exchange, you get faster trading experience, but man, you have a whole bunch of KYC AML, you upload a selfie, you upload your license, it's a little bit slow, it's a little bit painful, but it works. And we have 200 of those all over the world, and we need, we need them to be geographically disparate, right? So each jurisdiction has banking relationships, and so as you, as you sign up, as you're on board, you can't, uh, if you are a US user, you can't go use an Indian exchange. If you're in India, you can't use a US exchange. So this, this made a lot of sense, right? We see all these centralized exchanges. But because that architecture model, that security model, has not evolved in the last few years, we have seen some tragic hacks. I'm talking like really fucking tragic, like $2 billion or more lost. That's, that's terrible. How, how are we supposed to onboard the world to, to the blockchain space, right, from the last presentation? How are we supposed to do this exciting stuff if, if we can't even build safe infrastructure, safe venues? So, 2016, one man, Zach, in Chicago had a, br a bright idea, which was, how do we use the Ethereum smart contract technology, right, so this escrow technology, to solve some of these problems? And so he built Ether Delta. Who's used Ether Delta? Nice, cool. Um, 
So we call it the swamp internally at Radar. Um, so uh, if, if you've used either Delta, you know that it was a huge step forward in terms of agency, in terms of autonomy, in, in terms of ownership over, over your experience. Because you weren't depositing into a centralized exchange. But man, was it slow. Was it hard to use? And it didn't offer um, use cases. It didn't offer value to automated traders or other dApps. But it was a, it was a big step forward. So the, the spark, right? So the spark that led to this first decentralized exchange was, was Ethereum. So we were sitting on the sidelines using the swamp, right? Being really engaged and wondering, this, this can't be all there is for, for vendors, right? We, we must be something better out there. So we're looking for the spark. And we found it with the Xerox protocol. And we're going to talk all about that in a few minutes. But I want to introduce you to, to the third category. And yes, we have our logo there, but there's a category that, that's more important than our company, and that's this category of relayers. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why we use the word relayers. And yes, we were the first ones to create this category, and yes, we were very purposeful on the vocabulary, vocabulary. but it was, um, it was a very disciplined choice. So when you think of relaying, maybe you think of a relay race. Maybe you think of peer-to-peer -peer technology. And so this third category, um, what, it, what it allowed for was for us to do some category design. So when you think of category design, you think of like current coffee cups, or you think of Airbnb, or you think of AOL, or any of these different companies, technologies that define categories. That's what we're seeking to do here. So there's a whole bunch of new user actions, just like AOL had. There's a whole bunch of new vocabulary, um, just like Airbnb had. There's a whole bunch of new stuff that you have to solve for when you create this category. But the, uh, the cliff notes, Cliff notes on what a relayer is, is probably best described by actually just talking about our product. Um, so, so briefly here, so our first product, Radar Relay. You can see it over on the right. A lot of stuff going on. It looks a lot like a normal exchange, but under the hood, it's, it's very different. So you can think of us like Craigslist. So if you've ever used Craigslist, and you've gone and you've bought or sold a couch, and you've met somebody in some sketchy Walmart parking lot somewhere, and you made a trade. <laughs> Very similar experience on radar. <laughs> no, no couches. You're trading tokens, right? You're trading tokens peer to peer, and instead of meeting in a Walmart parking lot, you're meeting on the Ethereum blockchain. So think of this as Craigslist with a whole bunch of pretty colors and charts and, and images. Um, peer to peer, or in this case, wallet to wallet. And so if you go back and we think about this evolution, right? You have trading directly with the centralized exchange, trading directly with the smart contract, and now finally aligned with the core ethos of this technology, you're actually trading directly with another peer. So, um, if you measure those three, you have those three criteria in mind, or those three categories in mind, there's a lot of different axes of competition, or categories that you might decide, I want to use a centralized exchange, or maybe I'm best on a decentralized exchange, or I want to try out a relayer. And so here, if you, I'm just going to touch on it briefly, um, fees. So for those of you on, who trade on exchanges, what, just yell out, what's your exchange of choice? Crack it. Why do you trade on Kraken? Because it gives me $5 million out of that. Okay, now, another one? Binance. Binance. Why do you trade on Binance? Liquidity. Liquidity, okay. So, BTC. Why? Why? Uh, relatively easy ML, KYC. You don't have to show my left butt cheek to get um, a <laughs> transaction. <laughs> yeah, that's the wild west. So, so seriously, for those of you who haven't used an exchange before, oftentimes in the sign-up process, you have to take a selfie. So that's not, not far-fetched. So yeah, so, so there's a whole bunch of criteria, right? So there's everything from, do I like the brand? Do I align with the brand, right? Coinbase has spent a lot of time focusing on this institutional white knight brand, whereas somebody like Binance is really focused on, we have anything, we go anywhere. User experience, we're not going to talk about that. You just heard that for 20 minutes. Um, network liquidity, so this is your point here around how, how liquid is the venue. Regulatory strategy, right? That influences what KYC, what AML does the venue have. Fees, nobody, so you said, somebody said cheap. Do you say cheap for Binance? Yeah. Um, so fees, of course, that's important. It's where I want to spend the most money. Localization, I talked about this earlier, which is depending on where you live globally, that dictates which exchanges you can use. And then last, token inventory. This one's easy, right? If It, it depends on what you want to buy. So Binance has how many pairs do you think these days? So many. Yeah, hundreds, right? On, on radar, we have 172 different tokens, but Coinbase has um, five. <laughs> so, so it depends, right? right? It depends. And for some people, they're just looking for access to those. So, um, I'm going to cover the next part. Nobody has said what on anything complex. And I haven't used any acronyms, so far so good. This is the tough one. Um, I'm just going to touch on this briefly, but a lot of engineers, and I saw a lot of engineers' hands go up, um, they like this part, and they, they want to they go deeper. So, back to that evolution, so this spark. 
so the, the zero X protocol, what the heck is going on here? Um, think of it as, as two pieces. There's two things going on here. The first is messaging, and the second is pipes. We're going to take them one at a time. So the messaging layer, this is pretty simple. You're indicating, right, what kind of couch do you want to buy? How many cushions does it need? How long are you going to broadcast that order? Or in this case, tokens. Right? How many tokens do you want to buy? How long are those tokens available? And all that order data, all those parameters, are cryptographically signed, and that packet of information travels through a pipe. And that's the second part of Xerox, which is the pipes. And in this case, the pipes are smart contracts. So that's it. That's all there is to it. Now, what do we do as a relayer? We take those, those order packets that are coming through those pipes, and we, 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 ho we, we take those packets, we host them off-chain in our own database, and then when you guys trade peer-to-peer, -peer, you settle directly on the Ethereum blockchain. Where people get hung up on 0x is often, well, what the heck do they have a token for? Why, why did they sell a token? Do I need to buy this token to use Radar? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, so, so the token is a really elegant way to tie a bow around this whole process and make it so when the pipes need to be updated, let's say they're rusty right now, maybe you chose PVC and you actually wanted steel or actually you want some new type of polyurethane, right? The new technology improves and you want to update those pipes, you need to vote on that. And the token acts as a vote. The token is for governance. And so the Xerox team had the foresight to recognize that in their first version of the technology, they probably weren't going to get everything right. But in version two and three, they sure as hell will. But in order to get there, me as a participant running a business, you as a participant trading, you might need to vote on that. So that's Xerox protocol. So, in recap, we heard about exchanges, right, left to right, the, the slow but steady trajectory of innovation from the traditional centralized exchange to the smart contract based decentralized exchange, and then finally, in the, in the most current implementation, the relayer. We talked a little about radar, I kept it light, this is, um, I'm not sure if, if folks want me to go deep on our current product, I can do that in the Q&A, and then we touched on the Xerox protocol. So I have a whole bunch of backup slides, of things we can get into, we can talk about. But it's a hell of a lot more fun when I stop talking and hear from the crew what you guys want to hear. We can cover anything exchange related, anything Ethereum related. Um, so I'll open it up for, for questions. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I was going to bring up what we were talking about earlier. And the, the voting, um, so voting is really tricky on the blockchain, there's a privacy issue. But also in this case, it, it feels like a coin is kind of being shoved into a product. And if you don't like what they're doing, or, you, or maybe they don't like it, they want to upgrade, um, you know, you copy the software. Okay, so Corey's question is around governance, which, who is, who's never heard governance in the, in the context of crypto? Awesome. Full? No, no hands. Cool. So, this is a really hard problem. Alongside identity, this might be one of the hardest problems that we need to solve, which is, right, when the pipes need to be upgraded, how do we agree on that? And of course, question is, is, is the following, which is, what if Zero X decides they want to update their pipes in such a way that it hurts my business, right? It hurts, it hurts radar. Maybe we, we wanted a separate implementation. Maybe we want different pipes, and all of a sudden, this whole community, um, this whole community wants to move in this other direction. This sounds a lot like traditional corporate governance, like politics, like super PACs, like cartels, and so all of those same, and all those same problems, all the same solutions are there. So. Um, we are in the earliest, earliest days of governance. The Xerox team is probably the furthest along in how to take baby steps to get to this world. The first governance decision will not be one that creates existential risk for the businesses built on top of it. I think they're going to have the first few governance, well I know, the first few governance uh, questions they're going to ask are going to be baby steps to figure out the game theory dynamics around well, how does one cartel vote? Or are people even going to turn out, right? In the US election, we get what, like 10% turnout? So the question is, what are we going to get in, in blockchain um, and, and for token holders? And then second, another um, uh, sort of ambiguous gray area question in, in the blockchain, in the governance space is, what about all these investors that bought pre-sale tokens and maybe at a very cheap rate and own massive amounts of, uh, of those tokens and, and can dictate a lot of the community. It feels a lot like gerrymandering in, in that context. So there's a lot of open-ended questions. One of the reasons why we fell in love with Zero X was because of their vision to solve governance. Not here's the solution, but it's this, the process along sort of the, the journey, not the destination. And um, they have a governance researcher on their team now. We have an R&D director on our team that's um, keyed into this. Um, and it's probably the hardest problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you guys use a uh, US dollar on um, 
radar relay, relay, and then also do you have certain areas that you can't serve? So I know some exchanges uh, blacklisted in New York and Washington due to regulations. So two questions. The first question about U.S. dollar right, handling fiat. So that's a that's a great it's a great segue to the thesis that we have on how the exchange space will look in let's call it five ten years from now. So I think and we think that centralized exchanges will morph into brokerages. So what Coinbase, right, Coinbase has a brokerage and they have an exchange. I think it's going to look more like brokerages where they handle the banking relationships, they're very good at owning money transmission licenses, working with regulators, handling banking relationships, and they're like this on-ramp to the highway. Mm -hmm. And then the super highway of DAP trades and peer-to-peer -peer and, and um, actually using and engaging with the token economy, that's our turf. That's the relayer's turf. Um, and that's where it's crypto to crypto, not fiat. So we do not touch fiat right now. We have no plans to do that on Radar Relay or any subsequent products. Um, what we do is we have a stable coin. So stable coins, um, you, you guys, are, you guys are, are super well versed on this stuff. Um, there's about a dozen different stable coin implementations, either under development or coming soon. Uh, we have DAI, Makers DAI on the platform today, as a quote pair. Right? So you can trade against DAI. So just like on many of the exchanges, you can trade against Tether. Um, there's a, some really exciting projects coming soon. Circle has US dollar coin, which we're very excited about. There's true USD coming soon. And these are stopgap measures. Because we can't touch fiat, we can get real damn close with offering a stable coin. Um, and your second question was? Um, are there certain areas that yes. you can't serve? Yeah, yeah. so um, let's cover, oh, this doesn't even have it. Um, so we have users from over 150 countries already. So, so we launched in October. Um, and just some, some metrics on since we launched, we've been growing month over month in volume over 500%, um, which is just humbling and flattering and scary, um, especially when we get support questions from in Turkish. And nobody, I'm like, hey, Connor, do you speak Turkish? No, nope. okay, cool. Let's run, let's run this through Google Translate. Um, so, so we have users over 150 countries we are not blocking, um, any countries outside of the handful, the handful that are, um, right, according to like OFAC terrorism laws. That, that, um, but that's, that's the beauty of, of Relayers, is that it's truly a global liquidity pool. And anybody can access it if we get the user experience right. right? So right now we have how many languages? Uh, we have, I believe, four to six on the app and then all of our education pages. So, so yes, yeah, it's called uh, five, five or six uh, languages on the app, but we're, that's growing really quickly. Um, and right now most of our users, actually less than a third of our users are in the U.S. A lot of users throughout Asia, um, Russia, um, actually a lot in South America as well. Um, and so our strategy there for going global is community ambassador driven. So imagine, right, we want to um, go to market in Brazil and we're going to turn on Portuguese. We're going to go find somebody that's maybe either living in Brazil or, you know, in the U.S. and, and they're, um, they speak English well, they speak uh, Portuguese well. They're going to help us with support. They're going to help us with marketing. They're going to help us be culturally sensitive to how that jurisdiction might think about crypto. So right now we have three community ambassadors, and um, we have six languages, so you can see we're already behind and trying to step up to serve those countries. Yeah. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer situation, and you're using Craigslist as an example of that. So are you saying also that for every, if you want to buy, there needs to be a seller? Yes, I am saying that. Great question. So, so this is a Craigslist, Craigslist analogy. So, to, to take your point one step further, imagine if you use Craigslist and you said, oh, my couch is for sale and somebody instantly bought it. That's what's happening on a traditional exchange, is you post something and right, they, they take care of it. Um, you're trading with, 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 that, with, that, um, with that service provider in that context. That is not the case on Radar. The Craigslist analogy holds true, which is you put your couch for sale and it's 10 million, nobody's gonna buy that couch, and so it's gonna sit there on the order book until you get to a price point that is competitive that somebody wants that couch. Yeah. If the buyer and the seller are the same person, and they use that advantage to drive the price down or up based on. So what if what if the person who's posting the couch is then immediately buying the couch to, to create this um, hub, this hub of, of wash trading? So you the Denver couch market is. is <laughs> so so guess what that happens. That is and, and yeah well. Sort of. So, um, so that is happening. So let's talk about the, the dark side of, of crypto for, for a moment. So when you look at these, these 200 centralized exchanges, those are totally opaque. You don't know who those users are. You cannot look at those transactions. They are not on the blockchain. They are not using the blockchain for those transactions. You can't audit them. And so the scary truth is that 
a lot of that volume is this concept of wash trading, buying and selling your own couch to, to move the price and lower the price as you see fit. And that is done, um, you know, as you said, right, that's automated. Those are, those are bots. Those are automated bots that are written and developed. And so if, if you think about the, the mission and the ethos behind Radar, that was untenable for us. That is unacceptable. Like, if, if we're going to get to this place around self-efficacy and, and global liquidity, we can't have that. But it is happening. So there are, there are other layers in decentralized exchanges that are doing that blatantly in an effort to, to pull users in. I don't think it's sustainable. I think it's, um, it's pretty questionable ethics there. But the cool part is you as a user, you can figure that stuff out. Because you can go and you can see, hmm, this is kind of funky to me. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the exchange uh, mechanisms, I think I was talking to Connor in one of these presentations. And can you cancel? any orders that you put in at this point in time? Or are they like going to sit up there until they fill? Yeah, yes sir, you can cancel. So, so when, you, when you're using um, uh, an on-chain, right, so this is off-chain order book, on-chain settlement, and so the question is, well, when I put my couch for sale, what happens if I, I press the wrong button and I said, it, you know, it was way too expensive, or can I pull it? Absolutely you can, but you have to pay gas to do that because you're using the source of truth that is the Ethereum blockchain, um, it's not free. Um, and it depends on the network cost, right? The total <coughs> sense to, to up to a dollar or two dollars. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was there um, on July 23rd. I was in decentralized Colorado. Kind of gave a presentation on radar being laid off. How do you do? How do you do? But was it better than this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, one of the things in this slide was about cross-chain trading, which was yeah. like outside the Ethernet uh, universe. What are some of the challenges to get to that point that you've run into? Yeah, so great, great segue. So the future of DEX, what's coming soon? So um, I'll cover a few. So there's some like some basic stuff like Trezor support, right? That that's an easy one. Um, and they're very complex questions like cross chain. So that is how do how do we bring Bitcoin to radar? So how do we bring non Ethereum assets to radar? And there's a whole bunch of wild and crazy entrepreneurs trying to solve this problem with um, with everything from projects like Polkadot and Cosmos, which you may have heard of to bleeding edge um, submarine swaps happening on the Lightning Network. And so our job, what we do to manage that, is we have two guys on our team, our Chief Strategy Officer and our um, uh, Director of R&D, and they spend all day living in the future, trying to work backwards and figure that out. Um, it's kind of a fun job, and we are hiring for another position in that sector, if, in, in that part of the business, very interested. But um, right now, it's, nothing is promised. So being very candid, there's not a lot of promise um, on the short-term solutions for that. Lightning, and sort of this, there's a bunch of different implementations of Lightning might offer us a roadmap to get there, um, but we've certainly got some time. <coughs> yeah, I know, it's unfortunate, but yeah. Uh, going back to the voting protocol, is it a uh, percentage based on stake, or is it a one vote, one wallet, one vote? Question is, how, what, are, what are some of the governance voting implementations? The answer is all of the above. It depends on the protocol, it depends on the crypto economics, and it depends on the outcomes that the team are trying to achieve. So um, that question is even up for debate within, um, within the Xerox community, actually, um, especially as we get into versions two, three, and four. Um, but if you're very interested, so I think, so Xerox is about to release some stuff on governance, but Decred, if you're familiar with the Decred mm -hmm. team, yeah. they've done a tremendous job of, of trailblazing a lot of that governance work. Yeah, what else we got? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I mean, with that, that much growth, how much, uh, what kind of a priority, you know, long term is uh, like litigation or compliance um, regulatory risk? Like, if you had to think, like, okay, what am I worried about? What are, you know, what's going to like torpedo me? Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how much time does that occupy? You know? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> so, so the question is, um, I think your question is. Um, around regulatory accountability and like risks on the horizon. Yeah, I, mean, I mean getting sued either by a user, yeah. you know, or getting like looked at by cool. uh, you know a regulatory model. Okay. And I'm seeing Sasha hovering this last question. Uh, well I'm thinking Drew can set up and you can take a couple cool. more questions on um, Yeah, so so the question on regulatory accountability is is really important. So when when we have right these brand new categories coming online Everybody here is facing those same questions around money transmission, um, around security. So are these assets, are they utilities? Are utilities a thing? Actually not in the SEC's definition. SEC has securities. Um, and so we are very much in a gray area, but not, we're not 
the, most of the folks here are not bad actors, right? We're not doing this to take advantage of retail investors. So what we did is before we launched, everything came to a grinding halt in August, and I spent the month of August um, with lawyers, um, the entire month. And I don't want to tell you how many lawyers, how much I paid, but it was a lot, a lot of time. And we had to get up to speed on FinCEN, SEC, CFTC, IRS, XYZ, any different organization could and look at the case law and build a business case for radar. You'll notice we're not radar decentralized exchange, we are radar relay, and that's purposeful. We actually don't meet the criteria that US regulatory agencies have set up for what is an exchange. We're a software business. We're a bulletin board, more, more specifically. And so we're, we're facing a different set of regulatory concerns than many of our peers with different architecture. So I sleep just fine at night uh, understanding what our roadmap is. I'm, I'm concerned about the industry because our level of regulatory scrutiny and accountability is not shared by the entire industry, right? So, okay. Do, you, do the yeah. two questions over there, and drill set up? Questions? I don't know what's... Yes, sir. So, more technical, um, how do you protect against uh, dual transaction broadcast with like the same nonce, basically preventing your buy order from being accepted on the chain? So the question is around order collision, which is you put your you put your couch up for sale, and two people say, "I want, I wanted that one, I wanted that one for a long time, I want it now." And they both click at the same time, so that's order collision. And so in version one of using an open order book, that is theoretically possible. It's actually happened two times um, across our, uh, maybe two or two times, across our whatever, tens of thousands of orders that, we, that we've had. In version two, we're going to be, which, of 0x, which is launching um, in September, we have um, some more nuanced ways to uh, provide, it's going to be technical, so just prepare. Um, a forwarding contract, which is the second layer smart contract we can build on top of 0x to solve for order collisions before we get to a scale where it is a problem. Yeah. Now, the same person, though, was actually maliciously... Oh, briefing. Talk about briefing. Yeah. Same, same issue solved in the upcoming group. We've, we've actually been really... Across all of our orders, that hasn't happened. Um, which, I think, you know, as an engineer, like many on our team, are constantly looking for these edge cases, and we try to protect ourselves, but they just, they just haven't That's happened. Bad. That's not an invitation. <laughs> <It's> an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> all right. La cool. Last, Last question. question. Um, have, you, have you looked at the issue of... Um, uh, too, too, too fine-grained uh, pricing, uh, too, too many decimal places and, and abuse around that. And have you looked at that, uh, adjusting that uh, down as needed by uh, trading pair? Yeah, so if, uh, if, some the, if, the, if the UI was up there still, you would see that we're, we're enforcing um, a very detailed, very, um, I don't think, we, how many decimal places we got to? Like 12, it's like, 12? Uh, it's, I think it's like eight. Yeah, and, and that's a lot. That's a lot of information from the last user onboarding session. You imagine for an average user showing up and seeing a number that has eight decimals and how confusing that can be. Yeah. Our users, the users that we spend time with doing yeah. user interviews, they are prosumers uh -huh. and they are looking for that level of granularity. Really? Okay. Yes. So I've, seen, I've seen some abuse on some exchanges when they have to adjust that down to less than decimal place where oh, I, I you know, yeah. a tiny bit more than the yeah. other one that's on the book. We have, and they're we, winning the. We have not seen that. Where yeah, You've not seen that yet. No. Okay. Um, so, so last plug, it's not for radar, it's actually for our, for our category. So um, if you haven't made a trade on a DEX or a relayer, please go do it. Get in contact with the team that's running and give them some feedback, just like you, just like you heard in the last user onboarding session. And please make it actionable. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Round of applause? Yeah. is a longtime community member and um, also uh, without a doubt the most academically accomplished of all members that we, of all speakers we've ever had. Mm -hmm. His name is Drew Miller. Drew come on up. Um, Drew runs a consultancy um, uh, around blockchain tech for corporations and I asked Drew to present on um, blockchain technology within the supply chain because I think it's a really difficult uh, use case to generalize. I understand it on a really high level. Um, I understand it sometimes on a granular level, but I'd love to learn more about it, so I invited Drew up here to, to chat with us. Thank you. You may have read uh, that Vitalik recently posted seven hard questions for the blockchain community. And number two was, why aren't there any useful large-scale applications yet? 
Well, the answer is there is in the supply chain area. I'll show it to you tonight. There are a lot more coming, although Vitalik may not like it as much because they're largely in Hyperledger, not running on Ethereum right now. Uh, blockchain is going to be used in the supply chain area. It already is, and I just spoke recently at a supply chain conference, a national one down in Atlanta. The slides I'm going to show you tonight are largely from that conference, and they're all over it. I'm not saying they're using it all yet, most of them aren't, but they are planning to. It's going to be big, and the supply chain uh, industry folks are all over blockchain. So as I said, I'm going to show you slides from this conference presentation I gave a couple months ago. I had an hour to go through this. I've got 15 minutes tonight. So the first two are largely gone, and you don't need those. You guys understand blockchain technology. A lot of the others I've cut, too. Nonetheless, I still have way too many slides to present, so I'm going to go through them very quickly, highlight some points. If there's anything that interests you, just email me. I'll send you my complete slide deck, and I've been a management consultant uh, for a long time, and I do relief behind decks, they actually are self briefing so you really don't need me to get the value from the slides. I won't go over my qualifications except to say that I've been doing process redesign, operations, strategic planning, and work in business longer than our previous speaker, Alan, has been breathing. <laughs> I'm not talking about how blockchain talks here works, but I want to show you this slide because I know that Sasha and Kent have used this slide before, I've used it before to show blockchain, and really it's unfair to blockchain to use this comparison. Because to say that the status quo is like this, a centralized ledger, one nice centralized ledger that everyone shares, if anyone's worked in business IT can tell you that's nonsense. Uh, business IT systems and databases are a mess. You have tons of maybe centralized databases, but they're stovepipe. You've got an enterprise resource planning system if you're a manufacturing company that tries to interact with all these others. And that's just within your own company. Now you've got to go outside with suppliers and bankers, and you have to interface with their systems, and it's a god-awful mess. Now, blockchain is not going to replace this god-awful mess with one system, but what it's going to do, I'm not sure which screen I should go to, is it's going to basically let you cut all the way across there with one central, secure, shared, distributed ledger and some other advantages to tie this all together to get rid of the problems of all these solo, stove-piped, incompatible systems that we've got. And this is why it's so big in a supply chain. The other big thing is smart contracts. You all know what smart contracts are, but they are especially valuable in supply chain because we have so much updating of information and status. Your container has left the port, it's now on the ship. Uh, you've, you've got a problem with temperature, the Internet of Things, it can interact with that. And then it can automate contract things like you got a penalty because you were late arriving at the port of Los Angeles. You've arrived. You've accomplished everything you have to do. Automate the pain. There are so many applications of smart chains in a supply chain system uh, that there's tremendous excitement about blockchain. Now, I know there are people here who are Bitcoin, Bitcoin enthusiasts and they hate Hyperledger and they say it's not really a blockchain and it's contrary to the values. It could be centrally controlled by a private party and it's not open to the public. But I'll have to say that most of the applications I'm going to show you that are running in Hyperledger. Uh, there's several, as you know, several Hyperledger blockchains. Uh, and there's just a lot of good advantages from using a private blockchain, as we'll see as we go through these. So I believe, and a lot of people in the supply chain industry already accept, that almost every industry is going to be using blockchain for supply chain applications. There's an example here of a fish company uh, using it. You know, if you're using fish, you've got safety, food safety issues. Blockchain is great for that, because I can identify immediately this supply of fish came from this location and reliably and quickly get the information. And you probably heard about Walmart's been doing an application, working on that for quite a long time now. But the Internet of Things, you know, it's a great application there again. The temperature is really critical and we can monitor that in a container and get reliable information, time of arrival. A lot of Internet of Things applications are just ready-made for supply chain applications. But the biggest thing is that there's so many different parties involved. The producer, the transportation, the warehouse, an intermediary, a broker, uh, the food store. There's so many parties involved with all this information going back and forth. Having it all in a blockchain that all of you can access is just tremendously valuable. That's the hugest advantage right here. One trusted source of data that, as you know, you know is very difficult to hack or corrupt uh, that you can all trust. That's, that's very valuable in almost any business application of blockchain, but it's really especially valuable on supply chain. I'll have a slide on counterfeit goods uh, later coming up. 
this is an application I want to talk to you about. Some of you probably heard about it. IBM and Maersk, the big, I think it's the largest global shipping company. Uh, they've been working on this for over a year. The system works. I'm showing you slides actually from briefings we had with them back in January. The system's been up and running for a year now. Maersk has been using it and they're expanding it. I'll give you an update on it in a minute. But basically what they're taking is, you know, this jumble of different standalone IT systems and cutting across blockchain, cutting across sharing information across all aspects of it. And I got some better slides to show you that. So the producer, the manufacturer can get into the blockchain and track his part of the information and get at it, submit data. Customs officials, they've actually used it. They've got government entities in Africa and their test cases they've used who actually put in the customs declarations, the government paperwork you have to have before you can ship something or accept it for delivery when it arrives uh, from Nairobi to, to Rotterdam in Europe. Uh, so they've got them using that system as well. And then the, the warehousing and all the other parties that are involved in the blockchain, uh, all on this one system. And it's a, not a public blockchain, it is a private blockchain. So they have tremendous controls they can do on it. You can only look at information you're authorized to look at on this system. You can only change data if you're an authorized user. And I don't have to worry about a lot of North Korean hackers getting into this system, because you're not up on this system. You can only be up if you're a registered, approved user. And we know your computer. We know your system on there. So a lot of security advantages and other advantages uh, using a private blockchain uh, and Jim running on Hyperledger. So here's the latest update, actually, from today on this system. They've renamed the Tradelands. And uh, they've got 94 companies using it. They had, had the, and I'll talk more about this when we get into implementation. Their biggest concern wasn't the blockchain technology workability. The big concern was, can Maersk get its competitors to use this system? Because they want it to be the global ocean shipping system. And the answer is so far, yes. They've got one online, and they'd be able to get more. But that was kind of the thing that was kind of holding them back uh, for much of this year. But the new company name for this now is called TradeLens. And it's already in use. Maersk has been using it, I said, for a year now. Now they've got other companies using it. It's going full-scale commercial by the end of this year. And there's a lot more of these coming. Uh, the other reason why supply chain is really important application of blockchain is there's so much concern about counterfeit goods. Uh, one example is the pharmaceutical industry you see here in the photo. But I can tell you in electronics, I did a lot of consulting and work with the Department of Defense. Huge problem with counterfeit chips and resistors and, and data cards and, and IC uh, integrated circuits uh, that China and many other places counterfeit uh, and potentially do some really bad things with. Uh, and it's trillions of dollars in counterfeit goods. If you have blockchain technology, the belief is you can be sure that it really did come from your factory order from it. It stayed that way all the way through. There wasn't some trucking company that substituted goods for you somewhere along the line. Yes? Can we, can we walk through that? So, um, if I'm tracking physical goods and using a blockchain database to track them, uh, I'm scanning some kind of QR code or barcode on a pill bottle, right? Uh, at the very end, yes. Why wouldn't the, uh, the counterfeiters just, just change the barcode to match something that did originate from the source? Well, they'd have to get it at some point along the way. So the idea is from the time it leaves the manufacturing plant, I'm tracking it and I know who it is and whose custody is. So some, let's, the, the big example of it is a lot of times you'll get something in a warehouse, trucking company shows up to pick up the good, only it's the wrong company. They've got a tip off from someone working in the warehouse. They take your goods and then they'll sub to them down the road. So you have the wrong trucking company. Well, that counterfeiting trucking company probably isn't going to be in your blockchain to verify that they got the pickup and to get it all the way through. So that's really how you're stopping the counterfeit good. And uh, I don't see how changing a barcode would, would help. I see. So that. because they're not permission to be on this database, they can't get in it. And again, if, if they did do something like that, let's say someone did figure out a really clever way, eventually I'd find out, because I have your signature of your computer, that you broke the rules and you're a counterfeiter, so I can go after you now. Because again, you're not a North Korean agent on here, you're a company that I've signed up. And you know, I can require deposits and everything else on a private blockchain that you forfeit. Got it. So this is the I'm going to have to hold on questions. We've got a lot okay. more. I'll never get through right, my right. slides. So if we could hold till we get to the end, I'd like to do that so we can get through this real fast. I think I mentioned this earlier. Food safety is another big concern. Walmart and some other companies have been working on that. And again, I want to stress that blockchain, because I run into people all the time, they go, well, blockchain will replace all this. No, it won't. It doesn't replace 
the ERP system, the other IT system. They're still out there. It just provides a way to share information across them. And it can, over time, start taking out something, some specialized databases. There's certainly disintermediation that can and will go on. So over time, it can start taking out some of it, but uh, it's not going to replace everything. Uh, Airbus is using uh, is, is developing a supply chain application. Uh, Airbus has 12,000 direct suppliers they deal with, so you can understand why, especially manufacturing companies, with so many different suppliers having one system they can use to communicate reliably uh, and deal and process with and do invoicing and automate via smart contracts, all that paperwork, which is a tremendously uh, powerful application. Now, it's not all big companies, and there are a lot of startup. Uh, blockchain companies that are in the supply chain area, ship chain, and there's a lot of them. So for those of you who just hate the idea of IBM and Maersk and giant companies, there are small uh, supply chain companies using blockchains uh, that you can go to work for and work with. Uh, I'm a, I do management consulting normally. We can't name our clients. This is one I can. We have their permission. We've been working with Shared Chain. That's actually their new name we helped develop for them. And they're developing a very pretty revolutionary, although it uses some old technology ways to do it, way of managing the supply chain. And it goes a lot further than just ocean shipping. It's from the manufacturer through either a retail store or the final customer. Uh, they're adding blockchain to their system, and they're probably going to do an initial coin offering as well. Uh, to launch their company. And again, I'm going to skip to these slides here in the interest of time. The other advantage, if, you know, you, if you're doing a blockchain application, and a, the IBM Maersk isn't doing this, but you know, doing an ICO is, you know, having a token to run, uh, the, to handle a fee for the transactions on your supply chain blockchain system. That's another potential big earnings upside for you, as you all well know. So what we do in our consulting is help companies, businesses evaluate, should I be jumping into blockchain? Are there applications I should pursue? What's the return on investment we're likely to get and the likelihood of success? And it's a lot of questions. It's not just, hey, can I develop a blockchain technology and will I save enough money and expenses to cover it? You have competitive advantage questions you want to consider. If I got this blockchain system operating, better food safety, better assurances for my customers, does this give me a serious competitive advantage? So it's not just the IT issues. It's you know, how do we make a better competitive advantage and better competitors in that way? And the tool we use is multi-criteria decision analysis. It's a pretty simple operations research skill. We simply look at all the factors that could impact it. We compare blockchain applications and add the scores up. So, for example, ideas by nature earlier on was talking about the user interface. Uh, for a business-to-business -business application, they may not care a lot about that. For a consumer application, that's probably going to be a key criteria. Uh, can I get a good user experience out of this? Can I get people to adopt this system, consumers who are more fickle, whereas the business customers, they may have no choice. Here's the system, learn how to use it, use it. Uh, so there's a lot of criteria to consider, and our methodology goes through all that. As an example, we did a company that was looking at supply chain largely for the counterfeit uh, benefits of it. And you know, we have software we go through and do this. I'm skipping through this in the interest of time. Uh, and then we put weights on it, you rate it, some criteria are more important than others, and then we come up finally with a weighted average score for company X. There is an application now that scores very high, will have an adequate return on investment, low risk, we're pretty sure you can implement this, get people to adopt and use it, and that's how they, they decide to go. Uh, something that a lot of people overlook, kind of some common problems, is it doesn't do any good to adopt a great blockchain for supply chain or any other application if your key partners aren't going to use it. And remember what I said earlier, that was the problem IBM and Maersk were having. The system worked great, the problem was they had get other competitors of Maersk to adopt it. So they spent most of this year kind of redesigning the company so Maersk doesn't really control it as much. They renamed it, so it's no longer the IBM Maersk joint venture, it's now trade lands. So they've been working on that problem. That is a big problem for any blockchain project. The whole idea is to share information amongst other parties in business. Well, if you can't convince them to use it, it your system is no good. Uh, scalability, a lot of those issues you do with aren't that big a concern in the supply chain industry. It takes several minutes, it takes 10 minutes to, for a transaction to process. By and large, we don't care in supply chain applications. We don't need an instant updating and answer. So that's another reason why I think there's a lot more speed of adoption and use that you'll see in supply chain versus some of the uh, financial, especially point of sales applications. That's what you want uh, business process redesign is really the key part of most of these. 
And uh, so that kind of answers the question, what's an old fart like me doing in blockchain? Well, the answer is, if you're going to do this, as this author pointed out, it's not blockchain technology that's key. That's just like, maybe 20% of the problem. The big work is business process redesign, getting people to adopt your system. Uh, the legal issues we'll talk a little bit more about. That's where more of your time and energy and expense and risk goes. And implementation feasibility is a really critical factor to evaluate. It's not just IT implementation, it's adoption and other issues as well. And then the regulatory and legal issues. Uh, Sasha mentioned the Colorado Blockchain uh, Council that's trying to work on getting smart contracts accepted. That's also an issue in supply chain adoption, although I gotta tell you, for a lot of business people, we see blockchain as great because we want to bypass the legal system. We don't like lawyers. We don't like the legal system. And to the degree we can make everything happen automatically, and there is no recourse to a smart contract, we're tickled pink with that. So don't like that. Think, hey, I shouldn't have been penalized 10% because I was late arriving with my shipment. Sorry, it's in the smart contract. It executed. It's paid. If you don't like it, you know, get out. Get out of our private blockchain. Go somewhere else. So a lot of businesses really like blockchain, and again, in the supply chain area, because we hate the legal system, and we don't like dealing with lawyers. And so we see smart contracts and trying to put as much of the paperwork in process through blockchain and smart contracts is a great way to get rid of legal fights. Uh, common mistakes, I've covered some of them here, and I'll skip in the interest of time. And the other thing about our, our methodology is it's not, you know, here's the answer. We can do sensitivity analysis. So people can say, you know, our user interface example, that criteria, well, you've overweighted it, or we think you've rated it wrong. The answers are all there, and then you can play with the adjustments. You can say, well, you guys rated that an eight. We really don't think it's that good. We think it's only six. We change it, and then we see if that changes the answer. And the nice thing about our methodology is when you have 20 criteria, you can have people who disagree violently on a criteria issue and a rating, oh, I say it's a 10, you say it's a 1. You put in both, when you have 20 criteria, odds are option 3 still ranks the same, and you say, you know what, we don't need to resolve this disagreement, it doesn't matter, we still all agree on option 3. That is a wonderful thing, when you don't have to resolve uh, bitter disagreements. So key findings and recommendations here is blockchain is a go in the supply chain industry. I, mean, I can tell you from my conference result, uh, from journals, uh, there's an article now in the latest issue of Inbound Logistics, I'm sure most of you read that, uh, that quotes me and others saying that, you know, it is a go, it is being used, it is going to be more and more adopted by everyone. Uh, again, I hate to say it for those of you who love Bitcoin and think Hyperledger is, you know, blasphemy for not, not following Bitcoin key principles, uh, but Hyperledger is where most people are going, most businesses are going. Now it's not bad for Ethereum folks because Hyperledger has stolen smart contracts, stolen Solidity and renamed it. You know, they steal broadly from <coughs> Ethereum, so you know, you're not hurt if you're an Ethereum person. Uh, but most of them are going to be going with Hyperledger uh, and private blockchains. And uh, if you've got questions, again, if you're outside, you can email me. One other quick thing is in my big presentation, I talk about the book, The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Probable. Most valuable, important book I've ever read in my life, so much so that I wrote up my own Cliff's Notes for the books. If you email me, I'd be glad to send you a copy of my Cliff Notes so you can get the, the benefit of this book. So, questions? Ken. Uh, regarding the, the idea of the private public chains, uh, it makes sense that they're using the private chain right now. I go ahead public chains, uh, they're very slow, they're expensive, they don't scale, and they don't have privacy very well. But it's not hard to imagine a scenario, you know, five years down the road where all those things are, are provided by public chains. Do you see a role in that case for public chains? Or uh, do you could be, but the, the domain of private? Yeah. I like the share chain example I showed you earlier, and that's really massive. That's designed for small companies and you know, thousands of thousands. It's still probably going to run on a private blockchain. Um, uh, just for, for a whole variety of reasons. The security is part of it. I mean, a lot of people, businesses especially, don't like the idea of having a system where North Korean and other hackers can get into it. And you know, even if we're not worried about proof of work or 51% you know, of tax, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I think you're going to find the businesses, again, you know, I'm a business person, those I'm with the PC, other folks with the consumer, <laughs> focus on with an Apple. I don't own a single Apple product. You know, business <laughs> folks were kind of a different mentality, and so the, the security issues and stuff, I think are going to drive us still towards private blockchains, but I would not make a bet for you because five years from now, I, I have no clue. You could be exactly right. I don't know. Uh, behind? So, quick point on the question uh, during the presentation. 
uh, in terms of uh, authentication and, and counterfeiting. One of the things that, that uh, cryptography is really well suited to is non-authentication. Like before there was blockchain, there were PKIs, which was used as a, a token and authentication to get into the system. So it's inherently really good at doing that particular thing, which is why supply chain is just a natural um, way to go. But the question I had is, is around um, whether or not smart contracts are legally binding. Is there any legal precedent yet along those lines? Has it been tried yet that, that if a transaction is disputed between two businesses, that, that a smart contract is in fact? Federal finance, external and internal. What's that? Federal and external and internal. Whether it's in terms of business or a business? No, it's just a legal definition. Can remember, it's kind of a discipline. Businessmen understand is you can do something blatantly illegal and still win if they can't go to court feasibly and go after you. And so that's kind of the view, pragmatic view, businesses have. We're going to do the smart contract. We say it's enforceable. If you don't like it, F you out of our private blockchain. Mm -hmm. Try to take us to court. And our exhibit in court is going to be here's our smart contract, which has right. all the elements, or not all, but enough elements that we're probably going to win in court anyway. Yeah. But now you're going to come sue us. And we can also, if we're concerned about it, again, it's a private blockchain. I can say, you know, Kent, before I allow you in my private blockchain, you know, you got to do certain things, you got to pay any fees, and I'll make you forfeit your fees right. if you do anything like try to fight me legally in a smart contract. Right. So I can design my system to say, F the courts, and then try to deal with that, and they'll probably prevail. And I can tell you, this is all the time, most of the time you hear in a negative way, uh, but we look at the legal system as, you know, just because something is potentially we could lose in court, the best businesses, especially I work with them, a lot of them won't listen to the lawyers say, this is technically illegal. We say, we think it's the right thing to do, and we don't think we're going to get sued, because by the time they pay for all the pain and the trouble of going to court, we think we're going to win anyway, and we will. Mm -hmm. So, another question here. Um, it seems like this is really, like you're kind of using the blockchain as a immutable data, distributed database, which is a cool thing. I'm all about the tech, but it seems like you could substitute another immutable distributed database in there and have the same application. Well, it's also the, you know it also has the blockchain features so we can trust it. And you know, for the for IBM Maersk, well, it's kind of no longer IBM Maersk. It's going to be a group of people. I don't want to get into big governance discussions, but I can take it away from you know company X running this immutable database that you're. So it can have more and more of the features that you like in blockchain beyond just that aspect of it. Um, and then the fact that you can make a lot of controls, like the control over concern over you know, someone's going to challenge my smart contracts. I can have, if you use our system, you have to sign a document saying you will not take us to court, that you will obey the smart contracts, and you can have to put up a bond that you'll forfeit if you violate any of our rules such as that. So there's so many aspects of this that really fit. I guess you're saying, well, I could still do that in a non-blockchain database, but... Um, well, are the smart contracts visible to the suppliers? Could they go and inspect the smart contracts themselves, or... If it's all hidden, then on Ethereum, yes, but not all in high ledger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't hide it; they would have to see it and agree to it. Okay. Yes, sir. What does IBM charge businesses to use Hyperledger? Um, well, again, Hyperledger they don't own, and I, I should point out oh. the um, 
The uh, IBM MERS system is running on really it's Hyperledger fabric, but technically it's an IBM version of it, so there's a little bit of difference. But it's largely Hyperledger fabric, and the charges they've got, I don't know, I can't tell you off the top of my head. And they may change between now and full commercialization uh, end of this year. Most quickly, I appreciate more of a, a statement rather than a question. The chap who was asking about uh, doing this directly on something like Ethereum. Um, look at L2 solutions like Plasma Cache, uh, because that essentially has the same kind of promise as using something like Hyperledger, but directly connected to Ethereum and being able to exchange between right. you know, Plasma Cache and, <coughs> and the main network. Yeah, uh, the, do you know why Hyperledger was chosen? I think it was Arthur's quarter considered. Could you speak briefly just about Hyperledger? No, I didn't get into the details around that. I mean, I you, IBM was one of the founders of Hyperledger, so that's one reason they're yeah. going to back it. And right. you know, SAP is in there again. If you're in a business, these big businesses, they've got an ERP system. So SAP, if you're not familiar with them, they are the number one in the ERP software. So they've got all these big business people here, and so. IBM is, is absolutely promoting Hyperledger, right. and uh, again, they tweak it a little bit. They're using the IBM name on it, but it is Hyperledger fabric yeah. that they're using. And I don't know if they consider other stuff or not. Right. Thanks. Yes, sir. I was going to ask a smart contract question, but we're already through that. So, why'd you like Black Swan? Um, it's the most valuable book I've made because everyone makes the mistakes he talks about in that book. We're really bad at using probability when it comes to rare events and random events. And uh, it's a famous book, he won the New York Times bestseller well, for Nassim Taleb wrote it. Uh, but he made the point years ago, before the 2008 crisis, that you know, you can, if you're looking hard for black swan events, you will see them. You can see them, they're not really hit out of the blue. I mean, I talk about bioengineered viral pandemic technologies out there. I can show you tons of studies on it. No one pays any attention. I pay a lot of attention to it, so I'm looking for it. But it's against human nature to do that. And then the way we use statistics is so bad because we, uh, we assume it's a normal distribution and we do so many dumb stuff. And so banks will like lose. You know, they make assumptions, and in one day they can lose you know, 10 years of profit by ignoring mistakes. And Talib goes through all that in the book. It's a difficult read, I'll tell you that. It's not necessarily a fun or difficult read. That's why I wrote it on my Cliff Notes. Uh, so if you want to email me, I'll send them to you. I've made the mistakes he's talked about in the book because I'm talking to one it's human nature too. You're taught that way. I took a lot of statistics classes. And uh, so it's just a really valuable book. And in your business career, you're going to have black swan issues that will take your firm down from time to time. There's a lot of ways to, to get around them, to find them, and not be as one. Okay, follow up. Sure. Do you, do you see you know, the evolution of blockchain hyperledger? Do you see this as a black swan type of event? on you know, supply chain or you know, the economy generally? Well, I call it a white swan because I think it's a good thing, I'm not a bad thing. That is the term. It is a, there are white swans or good things that come unexpectedly. Uh, I, you know, I think Hyperledger is going to win in terms of big business. So I'm not saying Ethereum is going away by no means at all. I'm just saying for big business applications, I think they're going to tend to use Hyperledger going forward. And you know, you can copy Ethereum all you want. So if they invent you know, smart contracts too. I don't think there's anything to stop the hyperledger folks from taking it over and adding it to the hyperledger uh, feature. So I think they're gonna prevail, and I see it so far that you know, no one no smart person will make technology projections going five years out or even two years out. So I'll probably stop here before I get in more trouble. Well, hyperledger is open source as well. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much again. Uh, email me to us. Uh, All right, thank you, Drew. So just heads up, we'll be heads to our next event in September, probably mid to late September. We have Mr. Aaron. Uh, he'll be speaking about Whisper, which is part of the Web3 uh, to underlay and fly layer uh, in Ethereum. Rarely talked about these days, but it's going to lead to some cool things, I think, along with Swarm as well. So looking forward to that. I'll talk about whispers. Or whisper, whisper. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming out tonight.